What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Nourish with Renata podcast. Today, we are chatting all about one of the most common PMS symptoms and how to minimize or completely eliminate it with the power of food. We are talking about headaches. Now, up to 50 to 60% of women experience hormonal headaches during their luteal phase, which is basically the week or so prior to menstruation phase. Before we dive into the power of food to help to minimize your headache or migraine during this luteal phase, I want to first discuss what is a headache and what is a migraine. So a headache is pain or discomfort in the head and or face, such as in the forehead or temples, that varies in intensity and location of the pain as well as frequency. It may feel like a sharp pain, a throbbing sensation, pressure, or soreness. Now, a migraine is characterized by having four distinct stages. These are the prodrome, the aura phase, the acute phase, and the postdrome phase. Now, the first phase is a prodrome, and this is basically the medical term for early signs or symptoms of an illness or health problem before the major signs or symptoms start. The prodrome for each individual will vary. Some signature symptoms might be um, decreased mood, excitability, it might be sleepiness, it might be irritability, it might be excessive yawning, it might be a desire for specific foods. There's lots of different early signs that you might experience and you may notice this the more you have migraines. The second stage is called the aura phase. So approximately one in four people experience a migraine aura, which is basically when you may have a particular glow around objects, or it might be a light flickering or appearing to flicker in your peripheral vision. It might even be having a blind spot somewhere in your vision or tingling sensations like pins and needles. Some people also experience language dysfunction or trouble speaking. They might get more confused. They might have more brain fog. And similarly with stage number one, your aura phase might may be very highly personalized for you as well. Now, stage three is the acute phase, and this is when the full-blown migraine occurs. Pain is one of the most common symptoms when it comes to migraines, and it may be significantly more than a headache. This pain might be a stabbing sensation behind the eye. It might be a constant dull pain all over your head. It might be explosive throbbing in the temples. You may also have vision impairment. You might have confusion, more brain fog, unstable motor skills, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, speech issues, gut issues, sensitivity to light, smells, and sounds. You might have increased congestion. These may all be part of the acute stage. And the fourth and final stage is the post-drome phase. This is basically when a very mild form of your symptoms linger after the acute phase is done. And this usually occurs in roughly the 24 hours after the migraine is completed. So you might just feel extra tired, extra brain fog may, may still be there, muscle soreness may occur. Um, I like to think of this almost like the hangover period after the migraine. So now we know the difference between headaches and migraines, and there are several potential reasons why these headaches and migraines occur. They may be due to lifestyle factors, like for instance, if you're not getting a lot of sleep or you're highly stressed out during this particular time in life. It might be because you're drinking a lot of alcohol or certain foods might be triggering those headaches or migraines. There's also some underlying medical conditions like neck issues and vision issues that may cause some of these headaches or migraines. And as well, there might be loud noises in your environment, lots of bright lights in your environment, tight headway, headwear. And of course, our hormone changes, particularly as women, can have a huge impact on our headaches and migraines. So the best way to know if your headache or migraine is hormonally related is based upon when the headache or migraine occurs. So like I mentioned before, 50 to 60% of women experience a headache or migraine in their luteal phase. A great way to determine if this is you as well is to be tracking your symptoms, your PMS symptoms during your luteal phase. When you're tracking this information consistently and you're noticing a trend, you're noticing a pattern, this is a great indication that yes, your headache or migraine may indeed be hormonal. Now, the hormone changes that are supposed to occur in the luteal phase might be incurring the start of your headache or migraine. And these two hormonal changes are oftentimes the ones that indicate the headache or migraine is going to occur. They are the reduction in estrogen, which is your main female sex hormone, as well as the reduction in serotonin, which is one of our feel-good hormones or happy hormones. 
both decreases in estrogen and serotonin cause an increase in something called substance P. So substance P is an inflammatory compound that plays a role in pain, particularly in the head and sinuses. So simply put, to remember substance P, the P stands for pain. <laughs> but when substance P increases, essentially what's occurring is we're creating the perfect conditions for increased pain in the body, such as from a headache or migraine. If we know that the hormones, uh, so if we know that the estrogen reduction and serotonin reduction is triggering your hormones, then what we can do is actually use food as a really powerful healing tool to help to raise those hormones a little bit and help to prevent or completely eliminate those hormonal headaches. So how do we raise estrogen? We want to actually increase phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens are plant compounds that have a similar structure to the naturally occurring estrogen in the body. And as a result, it also causes a similar effect in the body like that of the naturally occurring estrogen. We can get phytoestrogens from soy foods like tofu, tempeh, and edamame, as well as from various foods and drinks, which also contain a lesser amount of phytoestrogens, such as apples, berries, grapes, garlic, turmeric, sweet potatoes, broccoli, and beans. You can get phytoestrogens from the nuts and seeds, specifically the seeds used in seed cycling. So we're talking about here the flax seeds and sesame seeds. Now, if you've not heard of seed cycling before, this is a holistic method for helping to balance your hormones using a very specific combination of seeds during the various phases of the menstrual cycle. If you'd like to learn more about seed cycling, make sure to let me know, comment below, and I'll make a video or a podcast for you about seed cycling, because that is one of the most powerful tools I see my clients use to help to balance their hormones. Now, when it comes to consuming soy products, I know that this can be a little concerning for some people because historically there have been some issues with a, a, a greater amount of soy product consumption. So what I always recommend when it comes to soy products is get really good quality soy products that are not non-GMO as well as being organic. Now, in addition, the amount of soy products that you have to consume on a daily basis for it to have a negative impact on your health is essentially 50 milligrams of phytoestrogens. Now, what does this mean? Well, basically, when we look at the people in Asia where they are having more soy products than those outside of Asia, typically, they generally speaking eat somewhere between 15 to 50 milligrams of phytoestrogens per day. For those of us outside of Asia, we typically have about two milligrams of phytoestrogens a day. In order to get 50 milligrams or more of phytoestrogens per day, you'd have to eat the equivalent of at least a half a cup of boiled so soybeans every day, which gives you a roughly around 55 milligrams in total. And that's quite a lot. Most people are not having that much soy on a daily basis. And especially if you're having good quality soy, non-GMO, organic, that will help to minimize the negative impact from soy-related products. But as well, if you're concerned about phytoestrogens from soy, there's also the other food groups, drinks, and herbs that I mentioned earlier. Now, when it comes to supporting our serotonin levels, it's important to know that serotonin production actually starts from two other compounds, and they are called 5-HTP and tryptophan. So 5-HTP is an amino acid that's basically a precursor to serotonin. You cannot get 5-HTP from food, but you can get it from supplements. So I do want to let you know that 5-HTP supplements may potentially have interactions with other medications. So you definitely want to discuss with your doctor about taking 5-HTP, especially if you take other medications. So how do we get serotonin to increase if we cannot actually get 5-HTP from food? And perhaps if you don't want to take a supplement for it. Instead, what we want to look at is our intake of tryptophan. So tryptophan is an essential amino acid that's really important for the body's protein, muscles, enzymes, and neurotransmitters. An essential amino acid means that it's an amino acid your body cannot produce, so you have to get it from your food every single day. Tryptophan can help with anxiety, depression, sleep regulation, appetite, pain sensations, as well as learning and memory. You can find tryptophan in turkey, chicken, nuts, bananas, beans, legumes, to tofu, or soybeans, 
fish and seafood like tilapia, tuna, salmon, crab, and oysters, as well as dairy like 2% milk, mozzarella cheese, yogurt, and eggs. And of course, we can get tryptophan in our nuts and seeds. So once again, hearkening back to our seed cycling, we use pumpkin seeds and seed cycling. You can also get it from nuts like cashews, pistachios, peanuts, and almonds. Now, in addition to increasing estrogen and serotonin through food intake, we also want to make sure that we're optimizing our gut health and our liver health. So make sure that you're eating lots of fiber-rich foods, especially cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, arugula, Swiss chard, bok choy, as well as integrating daily probiotics. So whether it's in the form of a supplement or fermented foods, probiotics will really help with your overall digestive health and having regular bowel movements. Now, in addition, the cruciferous veggies I mentioned are fantastic for aiding the natural detoxification of the body by supporting your liver health, in addition to being really fantastic for our gut health too. Last but not least, I want to make sure you're staying really well hydrated. It's actually been proven that due to hormonal changes, it may be a little bit more challenging to stay hydrated during the luteal phase. So increasing water intake or adding electrolytes are fantastic options for maintaining hydration in the luteal phase. Now, in addition to all of the amazing food information that I've shared with you today, you also want to look at your lifestyle factors. So if you need to get extra sleep during your luteal phase, reduce your stress during the luteal phase, really focus on those lifestyle factors too, because they all play a part in our hormonal health and minimizing our headaches and migraines too. So I hope that you learned a lot about hormonal headaches and migraines, and you know exactly what you can try to help to minimize or completely eliminate this additional form of pain during your luteal phase. Give these tips a try, let me know how they impact you, and you can always do that by sharing a comment below or connecting with me on Instagram. My handle is at nourish underscore with underscore Renata, and all of my pertinent links are linked below as well. Last but not least, if you want to do a deep dive into your own hormonal journey and the power of food to help to balance your hormones, be sure to book a 20-minute consultation with me via my website, nourishwithrenata.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next episode.